This is an example of running OLS in R and interpreting the results. So this example uses a data set called math panel or math PNL in the Woldridge package. And uh, it is a panel data set, which we haven't talked about yet. So what I've done here is just extracted all the observations in the same year in 1997, and then we just have observations for different schools in the same year, which is more similar to the cross-sectional data we've talked about so far in the textbook. So there are going to be two variables in particular that we'll look at. The outcome variable, the y variable, is this one called math7, which is like the school's average uh, seventh grade standardized math exam score. And then the regressor, the x variable, is this PTR, uh, which stands for pupil teacher ratio. So that's the same thing as the student teacher ratio that we've talked about in the textbook, uh, which is just sort of on average how many students are in each classroom. So before we actually run OLS, it's always a good idea to try to look at the variables themselves to try to understand what it looks like in the data. So you could uh, make histograms of the variables. You could also run this summary function in R, which I'll do now for both variables. And that shows you things like the median and the mean. You can see for the test scores, uh, average is somewhere around 50. Um, lower and upper quartiles are around 40 and 60. So about half of the scores are between 40 and 60, uh, but there are lower scores as well as higher scores. Uh, this NA over here refers to missing values. So there are five schools where, for whatever reason, we just don't observe their values. Uh, that's something we'll talk more about in particular in the later chapter. Uh, and then for the student-teacher ratio, we can see uh, average classes around 21, 22 students. Uh, most of them, or half of them, are sort of between 20 and 23. Uh, but again, they can be much lower or higher. Uh, student-teacher ratio. So the next line over here, I'm going to run the LM function, which runs OLS, so I'm specifying my outcome variable, and then a tilde, and then the regressor, and uh, R automatically includes an intercept, and then I'm going to store the return value into this variable named ret, which is short for return. So I'll run that line of code. Now, in addition to just looking at the summaries of each variable by itself, since we only have a single regressor here, we could actually make a scatter plot of the data, which is great uh, when, you, when you just have one regressor. So that's what this next line of code is going to do. Um, with some formatting arguments over here just to try to make it look uh, easier to understand. There are a lot of dots, so it's a little bit difficult to tell exactly how many are in each area, but we can see uh, you know, most of the classes. So horizontal axis is that student-teacher ratio, so most of those are sort of between 18 and 25, 26, but again some uh, larger outliers and some smaller outliers also. And the vertical axis is that math exam score. Uh, so again, 50 is around average, uh, maybe you know, up to 80 or down to 30. Also some very low outliers and some higher outliers too. Now on top of this scatter plot, we can plot the OLS best fit line, which is what this next line of code does here. I'm going to run that. That gives us this uh, blue line. You can see it's 
relatively flat looking, but it does have a negative slope. Um, and it seems to represent the, the scatter plot fairly well. The remaining lines of code here use those functions that were discussed in the textbook to uh, compute or to print out the uh, coefficient point estimates, as well as heteroscedasticity, robust standard errors, and confidence intervals, and all that. So I'll run that code, and then we'll talk about what we see numerically. So here, the first line is, uh, the first row is all about the intercept, so estimated intercept over here, standard error, etc. cetera. Um, in this case, the intercept is the fitted value when the student-teacher ratio is equal to zero. So it's not particularly meaningful since we never see classes with zero students for the obvious reasons. Uh, so this 56 doesn't really have any meaningful value so we'll focus on the second row here for PTR, that student-teacher ratio, pupil-teacher ratio. So in the estimate column, uh, this estimate is the like the beta hat one. So it's minus 0 0.2, basically. Um, so thinking about the units of both the regressor and the outcome variable, that says that a one unit increase in X is associated with a minus 0.2 change in Y. So a one unit increase in X means a student teacher ratio that has one more student in every class, basically. Um, so adding one student to every class is associated with uh, about a minus 0.2 uh, change in y, or in other words, a drop in score of about 0.2 points. Uh, so the negative sign is reflected in this negative slope of the LLS best fit line, and the fact that it's only minus 0.2 is reflected in the fact that that line looks relatively flat, if not perfectly flat. Uh, in this case, we might also want to think about larger changes in X and what it means then. For example, if we went from 20 students per class to 25 students per class, that's a five unit increase in X. That would be associated with a five times minus 0.2 change in Y, which is approximately negative one. So this OLS fit says that a an increase in student-teacher ratio of five is associated with a one-point decrease in the seventh grade math exam score. Now here in the next column, standard error, uh, this is that heteroscedasticity robust or a heteroscedasticity consistent standard error estimate that uh, helps give us a sense of the amount of uncertainty we have about this point estimate. Um, here, the uh, T value and this P value over here correspond to a hypothesis test of the null hypothesis that the true slope coefficient is equal to zero. Um, so there's a T statistic and then a P value here. It's in uh, scientific notation, what the E minus zero one means is take the decimal point and move it to the left by one spot. So we move it left, you see the P value is about 0 0.5, uh, which is not anywhere near even the uh, 0 0.1 threshold for statistical significance at a 10% level. Uh, so we would say this is really not a statistically significant uh, result here. Uh, even more informative, we can look at the last two columns, which show us the lower 
and upper endpoints of a 95% confidence interval. And here we can see the lower endpoint around minus 0.8. The upper endpoint uh, is not negative, it's a positive number. It's positive 0 0.45. Uh, so we really have a lot of uncertainty about even whether it's a positive or a negative or a zero slope. Um, also important to note that these endpoints are not extremely economically significant either. Uh, a minus 0.8 would be worth considering when thinking about policy, but um, most of the values in that interval are relatively close to zero. Um, so if you took it as a causal effect, which you should not, but if you did and you're thinking about policy and what's the you know, budgetary cost of hiring additional teachers to reduce that student-teacher ratio, um, you're not going to get a lot of uh, increase in score. And with these positive numbers, a positive slope would mean when you decrease the student-teacher ratio or when you hire more teachers, you'd actually be getting lower scores, uh, which probably does not make sense, but uh, highlights the fact that we just have a lot of uncertainty about our estimate in this case.